Ashes to Ashes, a hundred years of test match cricket. On Saturday, Australia and England will celebrate the centenary of the first ever test with their 225th encounter. Among those in Melbourne for this great occasion is John Arlott. Hello to you from the Melbourne Cricket Ground, the place the Australians call the MCG, the biggest cricket ground in the world, set on the site where a century ago as Richmond Paddock, it housed the first of all test matches and launched a century of history of the game between England and Australia that has produced a never-ending surge of excitement, drama and great personal performances. The century which saw the processional record-breaking of Bradman. Now he'll make a running again to Bradman, Bradman 99. Uh, he's got the short one, which is 100. The return blow from Hutton with an even higher record. Fitzgerald Smith again to Hutton, Hutton hits him. Oh, beautiful streak, there's the record. The fiery fury of Fred Truman. Truman in again. Bowls to Hawk and Hawk goes for and it's caught. There's the 300. And laterally, among the fast bowlers, this cold, controlled, quite savage hostility of Dennis Lilly. Lilly coming up. And it's to Greg. Greg a short one. He swings out of Marsh takes it out. Caught behind. Greg doesn't know it, but he knows now. He tried to swing that ball around. What a splendid thing it would have been to be here a hundred years ago with a microphone when, with no clatter of the trains through the station outside, Jolliment Station just there on the suburban line with its endless clatter of trains all day long. There were no trains then. It was open country with just a few grandstands and flower beds when Lily White's England team took the field in a straight white strip of shirts and trousers, but adding a touch of colour with their variety of Billy Cox and floppy caps, their assorted whiskers, the bright colours of the ties they wore under their stiff collars, and their brown boots. On that day, there was here a very lucky reporter for the Melbourne Argus. Lovely weather set in with a cool southerly breeze at midday and the match began in the presence of about 1,500 spectators. The Englishmen were well received as soon as they appeared and cheers immediately followed for the first two batsmen, Bannerman and Nat Thompson, who were at their post before the field had been placed. One o'clock seemed a late hour to begin a game that was to be stopped at five, especially when half an hour had to be deducted for luncheon at two o'clock. Practically, it left only three hours for play. And the people who stayed away missed the grandest display of batting by a colonial player which has ever been seen in these colonies. Lily White says he's seen as good a display in England, which may well be believed, but never better. Grace himself could not have batted with more resolution and greater brilliance than Bannerman of Sydney did yesterday. And this was the third of these mercenary English teams who went out there playing against odds, exhibition matches, just for the money. But they were beaten by 15s of New South Wales and Victoria, and the Australians said, come on, give us a match on level terms. They were contracted to go to New Zealand. They said they'd play when they came back, and they did play the day after they disembarked. It was an odd arrangement. They didn't know they were making history. Uh, what does matter is that David Gregory won the toss. Australia batted, and Alfred Shaw of Nottinghamshire bowled the first ball of the first test match to Charles Bannerman of New South Wales. Shaw was reckoned to be the most accurate bowler in England, and his outstanding contemporary batsman in the knot side was Arthur Shrewsbury, second only to W.G. Grace, they said. They were neighbours. Shrewsbury died, and some years afterwards, when Shaw was on his deathbed, in Victorian fashion, his family came to him and said, Where would you like to be buried, Father? And he said, 
But he moved 22 yards from Arthur so that I can send him down a ball occasionally. And surely enough, there they are to this day in Gedling Churchyard, buried exactly 22 yards away. I can't vouch for the fact that Shaw has ever bowled him a ball. But we have a view of Bannerman from that very perceptive Australian cricket historian, Ray Robinson. From what we know of Charles later in life, an easy-going nature enabled him to open the innings without tautness. Even in the most momentous match of his life, England's bowlers kept removing his partners. None could reach 20. I doubt whether the 90s had become nervous in those days. Anyway, Bannerman forged through them with three boundary hits. No photographs depicting his freewheeling style of batting have survived. What size man? Or hardly middle height? He could be grouped with short, quick-footed players such as Bradman, Harvey, Hendren and Robbins. Bannerman might easily have carried his bat, but he had to retire hurt after being hit by one of a series of short-pitched fast balls from Happy Jack Elliott. That's when bumpers began in Test Cricket in the first. For all jump, Shaw, Charmwood, Elliott could do the left-arm spin bowling of Tom Kendall. 7 for 55 in the English second innings gave Australia the match by 45 runs. Test Cricket was underway. Since then, there have been 224 tests, and for those who like figures, Australia have won 87, England 71. Now, to describe every match and every player would be wearisome as well as impossible. So, we're going to try to draw the procession in bold strokes, through sketches of some of the great players who shaped this history. Now, although Spofforth wouldn't play in the first test, he did appear in the second, and... So did Murdoch, the wicketkeeper he wanted, but not a wicketkeeper. That post was reserved for John McCarthy Blackham, called the Prince of Wicketkeepers. Murdoch played as a batsman and went on to Captain Australia. Swaffle took only four wickets in that game, but in no more than 18 tests altogether, he took 94 English wickets. What kind of bowler was he? The Spothoff stood a couple of inches over six feet, was long and lean, weighing only 11 stone, and could run 100 yards in less than 11 seconds. All these natural advantages helped him in the style of bowling he made his own. He studied the batsmen, saw their weaknesses, developed the art of deceit to the limit, and he had faith in his own ability. Spothoff in 1878 in England was a magnificent bowler. His fast ball had the speed of light, but in general, he was fast medium, with off-spin, links, flight, and the priceless ability to disguise his intentions and so confuse and perplex the batsman. He was the master bowler. When he bowled, the wind was in the east. The eager 1878 Australians first team from that country to tour England, apart from the Aboriginals of 1868, were rather meanly, not given a test match, but to the astonishment of cricket in England, Spofforth bombed out a strong MCC team twice in a day and beat them. In 1880, though, they had one test at the Oval, the first ever played in England. W.G. Grace went in first and, as all England expected of him, made a century. In fact, 152. Murdoch capped that by carrying his bat for 153 in the second Australian innings, but England won by five wickets. W.G. Grace, the doctor, the old man, or simply W.G., was cricket's eminent Victorian. C.B. Fry, most scholarly and versatile of games players, opened the innings with him, and years later recalled his batting. He stood his full height, and he was well over six feet. And he played every stroke with a real swirly arms. That is the reason why he got the reputation of being able to block shooters to the boundary. The simple fact was he came down extremely quickly from a great height and he very rarely missed the ball. And when he came down, I think the ball had to go and it went. And he was a very correct player. And he, he uh, stood by the old cannons of style. He radiated onto his front foot and he was a tremendous driver on both sides of the wicket. He made bowling look very small.
when he was on the job. And I'll tell you another thing. When he was in, he made everybody else on the field look like a boy. Australia won the two finished tests out there in 1881 to win not against full England sides. Then in 1882 they came to England and at the Oval made a mighty impression on the game and changed the shape of cricket history. They batted first and on a wet pitch, Pete first of the great line of Yorkshire's low left arm bowlers and Barlow, the Lancashire all-rounder, immortalised in Francis Thompson's Oh My Horn Be My Barlow Long Ago. Both them out for 63. Spoffer took 7 for 46, but thanks to Elliot, England with 101 led by 38. Then, while the wicket was at its deadest and wettest, Massey, the big hitter, made 55 out of 66 for the first wicket before the ball began to turn again. Pete and Steele took the wickets this time, Australia 122 all out, and England wanted 85 to win. Grace and Elliot took them to 51 for two before Spofforth made his conclusive breakthrough. He scored only 16 more. Boyle and above all Spofforth kept the game so tight that the last five wickets went down for only seven runs. This time Spofforth, the demon bowler of cricket history, took seven for 44. His 14 for 90 wasn't better by an Australian against England until Massey's 16 for 137. 90 years afterwards, Australia won by seven runs. And after the match, the Sporting Times printed its constantly repeated obituary of English cricket, ending with the words, the body will be cremated and the ashes taken to Australia. So the legend of the ashes was created, and they've been bitterly hunted and defended for a century. Australian cricket established a character peculiarly and enduringly its own. The pattern soon emerged of the all-rounder has been a feature of Australian cricket down to today. The first of them was the durable George Giffen of South Australia. One of still only three men to score a thousand runs and take a hundred wickets in England-Australia matches. The one English player to complete the test double was one of the answers to A.A. Thompson's favourite riddle. After W.G., who was the greatest all-rounder? And the answer was, no one knows, but he batted right-handed, bowled left arm, and came from Kirkheaton, which described both Hurst and Wilfred Rhodes. Wilfred, the only Englishman to perform the double in Australian tests. Rhodes' first test in 1899 was W.G. Grace's last, and he was called back to play a decisive part in the last test of 1926, when England regained the Ashes. And here he is, recalled by one who grew up under him, Bill Bowes. Wilfred Rhodes was, in my opinion, and in the opinion of nearly everyone who played with him, the greatest all-round cricketer of all time, a complete professional, seeking to excel at every department of the game and succeeding. He began his career as a bowler, took six wickets in his first match, 13 in his second, claimed 141 wickets in his first season, and after six seasons had 1,251 victims. In the meantime, he worked hard to become a batsman. In 1901, his third season, he scored his first century for Yorkshire, and for England a year later, shared a 10th wicket record stand against Australia with Lockwood. By 1909, he was the opening batsman for Yorkshire and number three for England, soon to become the regular opening batsman for England with Jack Hobbs in tours against South Africa and Australia. With Jack at Melbourne in 1912, he shared a record opening stand of 323 runs. On this ground eight years earlier, he had taken 15 wickets in a test match to register yet another monumental record. Not only were his performances of the highest class, no one knew the game better, the strength and weaknesses of opponents and the potential of his own players. When George Erst at the turn of the century began to bowl his left arm in swingers so prodigiously that he baffled all the best players in the country, it was Wilfred who set his leg side fieldsman a yard this way, a yard that, to make Hurst devastating. I recall asking him one day what sort of a captain Percy Chapman was. 
when Wilfred replied with real enthusiasm in his voice, very good, very good, he did as he were told. We're talking here of the great, which is a great word, one of you sparingly. Greatest, therefore, must be used more sparingly still. Well, we turn to Frank Woolley, whose view must be one of the longest of any man left alive. He played his first test for England against Australia in 1909. And we asked him, who was the greatest bowler in his entire experience? Oh, Sid Barn, for that a doubt. There was an education to me, the field first slipped to him. Time after time, I was had by what I thought he was bowling, because he was a great tall fellow, as you know, and he got long fingers, and he ran up with the ball in his left hand until he started the swing, and he put it in, you couldn't see it until he came over. Occasionally, he bowled his leg break of his, was the yard slower. Very few people had any doubt about this in his own time. He played briefly with Lancashire, more briefly still with Warwickshire, generally with Staffordshire, and until his 60s in the leagues, he didn't like authority very much, and he didn't like batsmen. Sid Barnes was a bowler of immense skill and immense achievement. In 20 test matches, all too few, he should have played more than twice as many. He took 106 Australian wickets at 21.58. We're not, though, talking about his figures or his skill. We're talking about his character, which I think comes out in this remark. The second match that I played in, in Australia was the second test match that I'd seen. And Glennon gave me a rest of 10 minutes at the end of 45 overs. And I finished up with about 70 overs with that 10 minutes rest. That's the difference between fast bowlers now and then. I should have put more work into it. You can't expect a wicket nowadays. Just toss the ball up and let it flip on. You've got to put the work into it to make it go. Sidney Barnes' first test was at Sydney in 1901. That was a match of historic names. Archie McLaren, Tom Hayward, Gilbert Jessup, Dick Lilly, Len Bond, Colin Blythe and Johnny Tildesley. For Australia, Joe Darling, Monty Noble, Sid Gregory, Frank Laver, Clem Hill, Hugh Trumbull, Ernest Jones and the man who holds a unique position in Australian cricket, Victor Trumper, a quite legendary figure and one of the best loved of all cricketers. Here recalled by an English batsman of similar felicity, Frank Woolley. What I liked about Victor Trumper was he got a hammered against us. A beautiful handler, it was a good wicket I admit as well, I got 600 against us. And I was in the field and cover, and as he was going out, I said, you know how to get out, won't you? He said, Frank, there are three great bats from Sydney in the pavilion, as good as me, they own the luck, you know, they literally got out of the match. He got all the strokes, didn't know how it was when on the bar they started walking to you. Johnny Moyes, who was a great admirer of Trumper, had this specific memory of him. In his testimonial match at Sydney, he went into bat late at night, and he was there at the close of play. When he resumed, he expressed the view that we had treated him rather generously in the matter of an LBW decision, and he proceeded to give us a chance. I saw him with a flick of the wrists, Lift a fast rising ball from J.N. Crawford onto the cycle track. I saw him vary it by cutting a similar ball for four. In the same over, he jammed down on a fastish Yorker and turned it away past square leg to the vets. But this is not imagination, <laughs> for I was feeling in the slips. And I saw it and marveled. The English cricketer nearest in feeling to Trumper was undoubtedly Jack Hobbs, who stands well ahead of all other Englishmen in these matches, with an aggregate of 3,636 runs and 12 centuries. This assessment of him is by Bill Bowes, who, from the other side of the fence, as you might say, observed him for many years, bowling against him. It was 1930 when I first bowled to Jack Hobbs at the Oval. He scored a 56 in an innings where I registered my first bowl century. One wicket for 104. 
Jack had scored 40 when suddenly, going down on his right knee, he half swept, half pulled a good length ball from outside the off stump to the square leg boundary. I looked in amazement. Nobody had done that to me before, and I was brought to earth by the voice of George McCauley, another of Yorkshire's bowlers, calling, Luck and stop, peeping, Bill. He'll show you a lot more than that if he gets his hundred. The next year, Jack got 133 and carried his bat through a silly innings of 300. A marvellous innings. But as we were all hurrying after the game to catch our train back to Yorkshire, Jack Hobbs, padded up and bat in hands, was going off to the nets. Again, it was McCauley who said, well, What's the matter, Jack? Isn't a century enough? And Jack replied, No, it's not that. I'm not satisfied with the way I'm turning the ball in my leg stump, and I might as well put it right. And Jack at that time was acknowledged the greatest batsman in the world. Wilfred Rhodes and Herbert Sutcliffe vouched for this. They spoke of his excellent running between the stunts and the brilliance of his fielding in the covers. I saw him make runs against the two best left-arm slow bowlers in the world, Verity and Rhodes, on wickets taking spin, and I recall the ease with which he played all bowlers on good pitches. Surely he was the greatest of all our England batsmen. Equally important, well, Jack Hobbs' records, his 197 centuries and so on, is the fact that this was one of the kindest, most modest, gentle and honest men. Almost the last, perhaps, of the great batsmen who could laugh when he was out. And somewhere or other, there's a great importance in that fact. He was, as Naran said of John Small, a good man. Jack Hobbs was followed by Walter Hammond, a powerful, commanding cricketer of cool mind and superbly athletic physique, a gifted fast medium bowler on a superb slip field, but preeminently a batsman who imposed himself on bowlers, matches and opponents. This opinion of him comes from the man who was to follow him in that great English succession, Len Hutton. Walter Hammond was, I think, the finest batsman on a bad wicket that I've ever seen. But to see him on a good hard wicket and to be batting with him and see his magnificent cover drive and his straight drives and those shots he used to play off his back foot that used to whistle past the bowler like a bullet. He was uh, in front of the wicket player and made very few runs behind the wicket. Uh, he didn't play this hook or pull shot. He really had no need to play that shot. He could hit the ball so hard off his back foot that it wasn't necessary to play the pull shot. I uh, consider he was the greatest cricketer that I played with or against. I played under his captaincy in England and overseas, including Australia, and I always liked him very much as a captain. He didn't say a great deal, he, he didn't issue very many instructions, but he rather gave the individual player a feeling of confidence that you were selected to play for England and you should pretty well know what the game is all about. Whether batting, bowling or fielding, he made this game look very easy indeed. I envied his skill, I envied his talent, and many times I wished that I had the ability that Walter Hammond had. Hammond's obviously beginning to enjoy himself. He went very quietly in the early part of his innings, but since then he's hit some typical fours. He's hit, I think I'm right in saying six fours now, scorchers, all of them. And possibly in this over, we shall see this century by Hammond. Oh, a lovely stroke. Four runs in Hammond's hundred. Short outside the off stump. Oh, Marshall on Hammond. The Yorkshire players used to tell the story that when Van Hutton saw Hammond bat for the first time, he, in the next match, went out and reeled off a series of Hammond back foot cover drives. It seemed after 1928-9 when he set a new record for a test series with 905 runs at 113.12 
that Hammond would dominate Test cricket for many years to come. But then Australia, as so often before and since, produced not one but two young bats, one of unquestionable genius. One was Archie Jackson, who made 164 in his first Test innings, and at the age of 19 moved those who watched him as Trumper had done. Five years after that century, the charming, tragic Archie Jackson was dead. The other, of course, was the Don, now Sir Donald Bradman, who over the course of the next 20 years set test batting records so prodigious that it's difficult to believe they will ever be surpassed. But this was not merely a matter of figures. It had to it the quality of genius, remembered here by one of his opponents, Bill Bowes. In that innings, there's something that cricket has talked about right away throughout the country. Uh, Dick Tilsley was a bowler, a slow bowler for Lancashire at the time, and Badman tripped up the wicket. He was going to drive Tilsley, but he slipped. Now, I don't care who it is, automatically, if you slip, you try to ease your fall. You put your hands down. But, oh no, not Badman. Badman, although he fell and he came a little crash to the ground, in the act of falling, he actually cut the ball past slip for a couple of runs, scrambled to his feet and completed this. Now, the newspapers were full of his 334, but cricketers were talking of this magnificent control of reflexes. Here was a great player. He had established himself. In fact, it wasn't a legend then. It was an established fact. He was a wonderful batsman. The decisive difference between England and Australia throughout the 30s was Bradman's batting. And in 1932-33, Douglas Jardine took a team to Australia, bent on solving the problem of Bradman sufficiently to win the rubber by the fast leg theory which the Australians were to call body line. Harold Larwood, the Nottinghamshire fast bowler, was the key figure in that strategy, and here, Lol, as he was called, talks about it. Bradley was the danger. We knew that when we left England is, uh, because the season of previous he had absolutely murdered us in England. He took 338, I think, at Leeds, something like that, on a dorsal wicket. And then when we played the last match at, uh, I think it was the Oval, he, I saw him definitely flinching. Whereas the other lad that was uh, over on Barty Jackson, a dear old friend of mine who's passed away, he never flinched at all. But the uh, did definitely show signs of, uh, of distress at the short ball. Jackson played everything correct, whereas Bradley was more unorthodox. But Bradley used to get the runs. And uh, if he got one injured, he wouldn't give his wicket away, he'd set and get another run and then another run. And as a uh, person, I don't think he'd ever be with him, I like him. Well, Lowell under Jardine won that rubber, but neither of them ever played against Australia again, and England never again took a rubber off Australia, so long as Sir Don Bradman played for them. What did Bradman himself think about it? It was not a very pleasant experience at all, because um, a cricket ball bowled by Hal Lowell um, would travel at a speed of, well, it's been estimated of 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. It was very unpleasant because the atmosphere between the two teams was impossible. There was very little fraternisation at all. When you've got seven men on the leg side and you add to the seven men the wicket keeper and the bowler, which really makes nine, there's not much use trying to hit the ball on the onside. You can't score runs very effectively. Um, you've got a great chance of getting out. So there, there's no future in it. So the only thing that I did was to try and counter it by moving towards the leg side, which technically, of course, is completely wrong, and trying to hit the ball under the offside where there were no fieldsmen. Now, I'm afraid I didn't uh, make a very great success of it because it was a pretty impossible job, and, and frankly, there was no real counter to it. You might be successful today, but uh, not consistently, you couldn't be. Bradman didn't fail all that badly. Of course, he managed to average 56 in that series, but England did win. And 
Even through his subsequent successful series, we must remember that batsmen don't win matches alone, and Bradman's runs were given their true relevance by the spin bowling of Bill O'Reilly, Tiger as they called him, and Clary Grimmett, O'Reilly the classic batsman hater, tall and strong, Grimmett the guileful, neat little master of disguised spin, and here... Clary Grimmett, that wizened, artful little man, is talking to Brian Johnston. I doubt whether I bowled two balls similar in an over. I, every ball was different, a variation of pace. Uh, I let it, released it from a, a different angle and uh, different spin on it, and controlling the spin by the position of my hand and all that sort of thing. How long did you practice a ball if you discovered, for instance, that he didn't start as a stripper? Yeah. And how long did it take before you bowled it in a match? Well, I've practiced it for about eight years until I was certain that it would fit into my usual uh, routine in the bowling. Did you ever get any wickets with it in test matches? Oh, I got uh, quite a number of wickets with it. It was, it was a, a beautiful ball and no batsman ever picked it as far as I could see. If he happened to play forward, he got out of it. But if he played back, it was through so fast that a very few of them could get the bat down quick enough. What then of Bill O'Reilly? Well, he was watched very closely by a fellow bowler, another practitioner. They knew each other on the field, off the field, and subsequently in the press box. Bill Bowes. For the title of the greatest bowler, I'm torn between Sidney Barnes and Bill O'Reilly. They bowled a lot. Swingers, off breaks, leg breaks, top spinners, had complete control of length and direction and could bowl at the speed best suited to the surface on which we were operating. If I showed a preference for Bill O'Reilly, the tiger as he was called, it would only be because he bowled a googly as well and because I saw a lot more of him. I've seen him knock the wicketkeeper down with the unexpectedness and viciousness of his faster ball, beautifully disguised and really fast. He hated batsmen and gave them nothing. I recollect in 1932 the season when Bill made his first impact on this test scene. England had won the Ashes and I was sitting with the England skipper Douglas Jardine when first Hammond and then Leyland came and said, Skipper, I think I can hit this chap O'Reilly and burst his bubble. It so happened that Hammond and Leyland were in together and, believe it or not, O'Reilly bowled at one time nine maiden overs in succession. Oh yes, they, they hit the ball hard. There were lots of tingling fingers. But could those two batsmen, Mr. Fieldsman? Not without taking unforgivable risks. I wanted no further proof of O'Reilly greatness. Towards the end of the 30s, England began to strike back to British young, highly talented batsmen, especially Len Hutton and Dennis Compton, both of whom were to enjoy their greatest prosperity after the Second World War. Hutton, though, marked the turning of the tide when England won the final test of 1938 to tie the rubber, when he beat Bradman's record and set a new figure for an individual test score. Oh, this morning, Hutton's gone from 300 to 332 in an hour and a quarter. He's been in for 12 and a quarter hours. It just uh, hardly bears thinking of the amount of strain that that's involved. Here's Frequent Smith, Frequent Smith to Hutton. Hutton right back and tries to turn it around the corner, doesn't quite get hold of it, and drops it down. Quite all right, perfectly safe, but no run. Mind the wiki keepers around there to pick it up. The total, three, Hutton's total, 332, it sounds like the total of a whole side. The Indian total, 707 for five and the gasometer sinking lower and lower. And here's Frederick Smith again, Hutton, Hutton hits him. Oh, beautiful streak, there's the record. It was a prodigious feat of concentration and stamina for a young man only just 22 and of slight physique. Remembering him across the years, coming in looking white and pinched and drawn, the recollection is of extreme exhaustion, but he still was able that day to give an interview. I am pretty tired, but not quite as tired as I was when I ended my innings today. After a rest, I feel a little better than what I did then, and I hope tomorrow I shall be fit and ready to do a spot of fielding.
Hutton was still there to open the English innings after the war, and Australia still had Bradman. But they also had a whole crop of new players, and just as England had been routed by Gregory and MacDonald after the First World War, so they were destroyed by Lindwell and Miller after the second. Ray Lindell, the smoothly controlled pinpoint bowler of infinite variety. Keith Miller, the young giant of violently explosive method and a master of surprise who drew English crowds and magnetised them. Now Miller is about to bowl to Yardley. And Yardley, he's bowled. All out. England are all out. 496. And now here comes Lindwell again to Hutton. And that was a magnificent inswing and it pulled him off his pad. So they went on their destroying way. But between 1953 and 54-55, England took the initiative with the finest and most balanced team of modern times under Len Hutton, the first professional to captain England since the border control took over test matches and the first ever to hold that office for a home series. He'd been so often the target of pace that he cherished it as a weapon and it was his fortune to have a crop of fast bowlers, the best of whom all of different talents were Fred Truman, Brian Statham and Frank Tyson. For two or three years, including the 54-5 tour of Australia, Frank Tyson was the fastest of the three. Brian Statham, whose motto was, if they miss I hit, was monumentally accurate. But it was Fred Truman of the panache, late and controlled swing, predictable but not necessarily playable bouncer, and irrepressible determination, who broke the record. He took 79 wickets in his meager 19 tests against Australia, but in all representative cricket, he set a new record of 307, and he took the 300th against Australia. Truman, a bit of a scowl at the batsman, doesn't even look friendly towards his fieldsman at the moment. His 31st over, his two wickets, wants a third, Truman in again, holds to Hawk, and Hawk goes forward, and there was no nicer touch than Truman congratulating Hawk. Hawk by Cowdery. Apart from the lack of a consistent opening partner for Hutton, this was a splendidly balanced England side with Bailey, Cowdery, Gravely, the Reverend David Shepherd, May, Evans keeping wicket, the spin bowling of Appleyard, Wardle, Locke, and above all, Laker. And quite inexplicably wasn't taken to Australia in 1954-5. If Bradman's record seemed remote, Lakers of 19 wickets in a test achieved at Old Trafford in 1956 must surely be quite unapproachable. Well, Old Trafford has redeemed itself with a last hour of flawless sunshine. And Laker comes in again, hair flopping. Bowles turns it on to Mary the field. He's out LBW and Lakers take the all ten. The fourth man to congratulate him is Ian Johnson. And England have won by an innings and 170, and Laker has taken all 10 wickets for 53 in the second innings. All 10 for 53. Australia came back to a period of dominance under Richie Benno. They won two and drew the other of his three series. And at Old Trafford, when England wanting 256 to win against the clock, were 150 for one. Benno turned and won the game all but single-handed. The commentator here is Rex Alston. And it's Benno to May. Now this is an intriguing duel as May pushes out and the ball goes behind the wicket on the leg side fielded by Birch. I noticed that Benner still got his outfield. I don't anticipate that May is going to lock run into the outfield quite yet, if he does at all, but he's had a go. Does he mean bowled round his legs? legs. <laughs> Balding must be. Bowled for North, round his legs. He stayed, he stood there and swung. No, he's quite certain he bowled him. May couldn't believe it. And May's out, bowled Benner North. 
What a funny game cricket is. Yes, I'm told. Now, except for Ellingworth to turn and sortie to Australia in 1970-71, England haven't won a rubber since 1956. For the last 13 years, though, they've been bravely sustained by John Edrich, who surpassed all the other moderns, even Colin Cowdery, in his figures against Australia. Unprepossessingly, but with quite unfailing guts and concentration, he's hauled himself up the table until only five batsmen of either country stand ahead of him in Anglo-Australian tests, and all now stand in his sights except Bradman and Hobbs, and only those two better his nine centuries in these matches. England's most consistent counter has been Derek Underwood, the man his captains carry around like an umbrella in case of rain. When an army of volunteers made the oval fit for play in 1968, and Oliveira made the breakthrough, Underwood won the match to draw the series. It's uh, very, very tense indeed. I suppose there are three possible overs to go, and I would have thought Inverarity's job now would be to try and keep out Underwood at all costs, because Underwood is the main threat. And now Underwood comes in and bowls, and Inverarity covers up, going on the backstroke there and playing out on the offside. Now that held, it didn't turn much. If he's bowling round the wicket, it just about held. Nervous strain on both sides now. So, situation in which a bowler could press too much. Underwood comes in, bowls, and he's out. Played deliberately with his fired in variety. Just missed carrying his back to a ball that just about straightened. In variety is LBW, pulled Underwood. And any moment now, Bill Fringle will tell me how many England have won by. But they've won. 226 they've won by. Australia retain the ashes, but England have tied the series. Australia, for their part, have lately been successful against all countries through their fast bowlers, the pair who gave rise to the two lines. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If Lily don't get you, Tomo must. Dennis Lilly made the most remarkable return after spinal damage, usually final so far as a fast bowler is concerned, to take 25 wickets in Australia in 1974-75, 21 in England in 1975, and here is Lilly as he sees himself and cricket and as the commentators see him. I don't like batsmen getting runs against me. If they do, I get upset. That helps my game. Lily Bonnie again to Fletcher. And Fletcher gets a filthy one. Oh, that was nasty. He lifted quickly off the pitch. And it came careering right at his face. I thought he was going to collect it. And suddenly turned away. And it was only an inch off. That ball lifted. It was fairly short. But simply flew off the pitch. Not only did it do that. But it cut back. And kept searing right at his face. I thought he really had it there. He was very lucky then. Our style of game... Uh has moved with a generation, a lot more people swear now, just out of nature, they do, whether you like it or not, they do, and because people swear on the field, it's just an outlet of frustration, of not getting a wicket or of having been hit around, uh, and as far as I'm, I'm concerned, it doesn't mean that the game's not a gentlemanly game anymore, I just think that uh, as things have changed in the world, so is cricket. Lily coming up, and it's to Greg. Greg a short one, he swings out of Marsh takes it out, caught behind, Greg doesn't know it, but he knows now. He tried to swing that ball round the onside, got the catch, didn't look at the umpire, Marsh dived after it, uh, made a beautiful catch of it. Uh, I thought for a moment the deflection company's body, but it was obviously the bat, and the Marsh dived. In the centenary match, one of the sternest confrontations must be between Dennis Lilly and Tony Gregg. Lilly's taken Gregg's wicket five times in the last ten tests, and each has a respect for the other's ability, though there's no doubt that in both cases the respect is very aggressive. The biggest thing to always remember is that the Australians are the arch enemy, and uh, there's no Australian that I love when I see him on a cricket field. In fact, I'd probably go so far as to say that every Australian I bump into on a cricket field I hate. And that sums up the whole situation. And um, at the end of the day, we have a beer with them. And uh, we're all very happy and we've got some fine friends. But for an Englishman, I think that the big one is the Aussies. And uh, I would say that nothing in the world would give me more pleasure than beating the pants off him. I've said this before and I'd have to say it again and again because that's what I want to do more in my career than anything else. And I think that sums it up. It really is good fun. Well, Greg.
Craig, and not only Craig, but at least 10 other Englishmen and 11 Australians will have the opportunity to put this to the test six times within this next year. And now even as the trains clutter by and the players practice for the centenary test and the hoses flood the ground and the hammering goes on over in the stands, we await the outcome of this historic test match. After a hundred years of competition between England and Australia, they meet again in this magnificent circular bowl that will have its capacity of more than 100,000 savagely tested this coming weekend for a match which may be a celebration, but is certainly not fun. Ashes to Ashes was introduced by John Hollott, and he'll be one of the commentators from the centenary test on Saturday morning on Radio 3 from 6 o'clock to 5 past.